I just thought I'd have a bit of a vid on old Overtons and uh, it's quite an interesting subject because I've just recently sold um, an Overton that was virtually identical to Davis Spillane's Overton. It's what people are now calling the big hole Overton. Um, they were made sort of from the mid 70s uh, up until I think probably the 90s. And this is part of the story of the low whistle, which I think hasn't really been told. So I thought I'd try and put my uh, five bobs worth in for what uh, for what it's worth. Um, the first Overton that I bought was in 1990. Um, it was uh, like everybody else, what they call rocking horse ship. You couldn't get hold of one. You had to sort of. There was no internet, not to speak of. So to find something like this, it was a sort of word of mouth. And not being from the folk community, I found it quite difficult to sort of find anybody. And eventually I came across a company called Hobgoblin. Uh, they had a shop down in Crawley. So I went down there after having had my uh, kind of introduction to whistles was finding a uh, fear dog high D down the back of my sofa one day that a friend's child had left uh, and uh, it had gone down the back of the sofa and I was cleaning the sofa, I found it, I started doing as you do, being a guitarist you play something that is very easy on the whistle and I thought oh, there's nothing to this whistle and um, a friend of mine at the time um, whose name was Colin Goldie, said, oh, um, you play the whistle. I said, oh, I don't really. He said, oh, well, I play a bit of whistle. And uh, we started playing whistly tunes together. And um, from then on, he then said, oh, have you heard of a low whistle and Davis Spillane and all of that sort of stuff? So it was via Colin that I learned about moving hearts and Davis Spillane and this thing called a low whistle. Can imagine. Um, so, being a string player and bass player at the time, I was intrigued, listened to the music, and if anyone knows Moving Hearts, they had a bass player called Owen O'Neill, who was the Irish equivalent to Jacko Pas Pastorius. So, that got me very interested in the whole kind of concept of Irish music with a Pastorius type fretless bass player. So, that's really how I arrived in. Irish music to begin with. The other stuff goes back further, seeing the Chieftains and seeing Matt Malloy playing um, the Mason's Apron at Glastonbury in probably 78 was another pivotal point, but that's a, another story. Um, so we found a Celtic music shop in Camden that sold something called a Howard Low D. It was a Low D, so we bought one, well I did, and it sounded like an organ pipe. It didn't have any resemblance to anything Davy Spillane was playing, and after having listened quite a bit to Davy Spillane's music and Moving Hearts, I wanted that sound. So I had this thing, that's the only thing I could describe it as, as a thing, that made a honking sort of sound and I decided it not only was it horribly out of tune, I just didn't like A, the look of it and B, the way it sounded. So that went in the, uh, the box and um, that's when I found Hobgoblin and I bought this whistle. And uh, it has Overton stamped on the back, it's got a large D, but it's of the same style head as what Davis whistle is very 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 short block slightly longer than Davies this I would say is about well, slightly about 9 mil Davies is probably about 7 mil like the one I've just sold so a very very short windway this is probably 3 or 4 mil longer so from the early 70s to the 90s he's gradually increased the length of the windway Quite a large hole, 
but he's reduced the size of the holes somewhat. So this was my first experience of an Overton, this whistle. And um, I had it for some time. I noticed that it had a very, very ultra thin windway. If you can see that, it's very thin. I mean, that is from top to bottom, two and a half, possibly three mil. Uh, and it's a very, very narrow gap, very narrow, so the air, and this is how he was making them, a very, very tight windway, very short, so that it was uh, energy com compressed very hard onto that blade, which gave you, but to achieve that, you really had to blow it, and a lot of whistle players, from what I've learned from the past, didn't really like having to expel so much air. But the people that picked up on them were the pipers because they didn't mind, especially Scottish pipers, they're blowing all day long. So in Scotland, this really, this huge back pressure with this massive sound, some control you can push it into the third octave so this was the norm pretty much until I met Bernard Overton and the reason I met Bernard Overton was the fact that this didn't work it didn't really it was slightly out of tune and it didn't I couldn't just get it to work so he said that he was working on this back pressure with this really small opening and he would make me one that had slightly less back pressure but gave a much more open sound so I kept this one and he made me at my request a slightly longer windway a little bit more block which I thought personally after having that one for some time it looked nicer but it gave me it gave me power not that the other one didn't have power but at less back pressure there was a little bit more airflow so I wasn't feeling choked up and I remember having a conversation with um, a friend of mine who was a fantastic flute player, uh, Niall Keegan, and he said he, he, Overton whistles, he just couldn't expel enough air. He was just gagging because he couldn't get the air out. So when I asked o Bernard to actually increase a little bit the opening and extend it, that's how we ended up with that kind of Overton. 1990. You won't have seen one of these before 1990. And this is where the kind of standard later Overtons through the big Irish whistle explosion, which was the 90s and early noughties as they call it. This is, this is now the standard shape of a Kerry Pro and of a Goldie. But it's as a result of extending the windway and extending the length of the block and opening it up slightly has made it a more what I would class as universal whistle because you don't have to be a Scottish bagpiper to really get the best out of it. And people like David Spillane really exploited the fact that with that kind of back pressure, if you can learn breath control and take copious quantities of air you can make this sound like the Ilan pipes and give it all of that texture and breath and when you listen to some of Davy's passages and I've played Davy's passages when I did the May Morning Dew video you learn something else when you're holding notes for that long and you need a certain type of whistle to be able to do that and these whistles made it very easy because they were a very 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 narrow windway over a very large hole 
but a very short mouthpiece. This gave a huge amount of pressure onto that blade and that was going to make the barrel perform amazingly well. And with those massive holes, this one doesn't have the really big holes, this is his kind of second or even third generation hole pattern. Um, you still have that very big gap between the fifth and sixth hole, but most pipers wouldn't worry about things like that. something to be said for these early Overtons. They're, um, they're a beast. They really are a beast. But you really have to learn how to take lungfuls of air and big lungfuls of air and learn how to control that breath. If you can do that, you can, you can have fun and games on these instruments. So there we are. That's a, a little bit about uh, the transformation from this to this. There we go.